choir for that. What a beautiful song. I'm so glad that heaven came down. Save my soul. You have your Bibles, and I hope that you do. Let's turn to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, a title this morning's sermon, Thanksgiving More Than Words. We continue our study on sticks and stones and the power of words, although we're going to look at it from a different perspective of thanksgiving. And um, sometimes we go through the motions of thanking God for different things in our life and what He's done and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, But I believe that thanksgiving is more than words. It's more than just saying, thank you, God, or uh, thank you for this blessing. I believe it comes uh, from a heart, or I think that thanksgiving that God desires of us comes from the heart. And so we're going to look at that this morning in Psalm 78. Psalm 78, 36 through 39. Uh, We're going to look at several places within this psalm, but I want to highlight it by looking at these four verses. 36 through 39. If you have it, say amen. All right, let's read the Word of God. It says, Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth. And they lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for this time, for this privilege of worship. God, we thank you that you are sovereign. And God, nothing escapes you, nothing surprises you, nothing catches you off guard. For you know where we are and what we are going through. God, may we be thankful from the bottom of our hearts for all that you are doing, for all that you have done. There's not a one in the sound of my voice this morning who can look at their life and say, I am not blessed, for we all are blessed. But God, may we give and offer thanks to you from the bottom of our hearts, not just mere lip service. Or may we be convicted this morning. Lord, of things that we have put ahead of you, in front of you. Lord, for things that we give credit to that are apart from you. Lord, may you draw close to us as we draw close to you this morning. Lord, may you bless the reading and the teaching and preaching of your word. May you be exalted. And Lord, may you draw us all to you. But most of all, we pray if there's one here today without you, lost, we pray that they'll come and give their life to you and be eternally changed. Meet with us and be with us. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thanksgiving, um, more than words. First of all, let me thank you as a congregation for providing Sonia and I the opportunity to go on the mission trip to Thailand. It was um, truly an eye-opening and life-changing experience. Now, at a later date, Um, probably on a Wednesday or a Sunday night, I'll speak about what we witnessed and what we learned on our trip. And, of course, share a few pictures with you. For those of you who don't have Facebook, uh, it'll all be new to you. But we tried to kind of give a glimpse to what we experienced. And, of course, pictures only say so much. So we're looking forward to the opportunity to share. But I do want to say thank you uh, for that opportunity uh, that you allowed us to have. But when you go into a third-world country, Uh, and nation, and you sit in their houses, of which Sonia and I were able to do. And in many cases, uh, it's not a house at all. It's just a 10 by 10 uh, block room, uh, of which many didn't even have roofs on. Now, the one we sat in, of course, had a roof over it, um, and we talked with the people. So when you do that and you talk with the people, it'll give you a whole new perspective on life, especially life in America. We have a lot to be thankful for today. Amen? I hope that you take some time this week and give thanks to God for His many blessings. But what I want to challenge you with is is to make thanksgiving more than lip service. 
to make Thanksgiving more than lip service. As a matter of fact, I think that true and biblical Thanksgiving is more than just lip service. It's more than words. Thanksgiving is a reflection of the heart. When you see people who aren't thankful, when you experience someone who is not appreciative, um, it is a reflection of their heart. And I hope that as you offer thanks this week, that is a reflection of a heart that is truly thankful and that what you speak is more than just lip service. And so as we look at this psalm, I see a lot of similarities uh, between the children of Israel of this time and America today. A lot of similarities. And so notice with me this morning the parallels between modern America and and Israel of the Bible. And then we're going to take a look at what God prefers. We're going to look at the parallels, and then we're going to look at what God prefers uh, from us, not just on Thanksgiving, but every day uh, of our lives. And so let's notice the parallels. The parallels between modern America and Israel. Number one, the number one parallel between modern America and Israel that we see in our passage today is that they both were rich. They both were rich. The Israel of the Bible during the, the kingship of David and America today uh, were both rich. Let's look at verse 23 through 30. Look how rich the nation is. Verse 23 through the first part of verse 30. It says, uh, Yet he had commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven and rained down manna on them to eat and give them the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in heavens, and by his power he brought the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas. And he let them fall. And, the, and he let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings. And so they ate and were well filled. For he gave them their own desire. They were not deprived of their craving. For while their food was still in their mouths. And so what we see here is God made it rain bread. God made it rain meat. From heaven. I mean, it was just like, okay, you have these cravings, you have this desire, I'm going to give it to you. And God just rained down their desire, uh, rained down this meat and this bread from heaven. Evidently, He gave them some of the angels' food, according to verse 25. God said, He gave them their cravings and food to the full. Without a doubt in my mind, we live in a blessed nation, much like that. I heard it said one time that if you can reach into your pockets and pull out any amount of change, then you're in the top 10% of the richest people in the world. If you can just reach in your pocket and pull out change, then you're in the top 10% of the richest people in the world. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I have no idea, but from what I saw in Thailand, um, it very well could be true. Um, our last meal in Thailand was... <laughs> outside a garage it was really kind of crazy um but that's kind of the way they do things so it wasn't really a restaurant but it's kind of a restaurant it wasn't really a garage it was like a carport and so we pull up and there's tables there and um i'm thinking to myself okay ed is this really safe and of course he goes and he takes pictures and i got pictures of the kitchen and where we eat but we wouldn't let sonia see the pictures before we ate of their kitchen. But anyway, we sat down and uh, we ate. I mean, we ordered appetizers. We got nachos, homemade nachos, uh, not made from flour or not, no, they were not made for corn or something. I don't know. They had a distinct taste to them, um, but they were called nachos or tortillas and we had some salsa and we had a dish. Uh, I had some kind of noodles and chicken. I guess it was chicken. Um, and Sonia had some chicken, cashews and and rice. Anyway, this was a big meal. I mean, it would look pretty big. It was very filling. Ordered an appetizer, and all four of us ate for under ten dollars, American dollars. Under four people, that's less than two dollars a per, or less than two dollars and fifty cents a person. And so, when you go to a third world country like that, you can definitely see uh, the poverty, and you can definitely see the richness of America. As a matter of fact. 
um, most Thai people work 12 hour day, 12 hour days, seven days a week, right? Because you couldn't tell if it was Sunday or Monday. You couldn't tell what day of the week it was based upon how busy the streets and the traffic were. But they would work 12 hours a day, many of them seven days a week for like $3 a week. $3 a week. And that was for even some of the skilled workers. And so we have people in America boycotting for $15 an hour for an unskilled job. It really puts things in perspective. When you see people working 72 to 84 hours a week for three dollars three dollars and then you come to america and you see people boycotting for 15 dollars an hour we are blessed in america we are blessed in america everyone here this morning looks like you're doing pretty well you've got nice clothes we all have nice clothes now i'm not saying that we don't struggle financially i'm not saying that there's not struggles at times but without a doubt we are blessed by God. Think about our natural resources here in America. Do you think the early settlers ever dreamed of the self-sufficient land like we have here in America? We don't have to go outside for other food and things like that outside of America. We can grow it and produce it here in our land, here in our nation. Our land here in America is self-sufficient. I don't think they fully knew what all the land would provide for them when they came over to America. But God gave them these blessings, and He gave these blessings to us. It's like God rained down these blessings, as we see in our passage of Scripture, with the Israelites. And so we live in a blessed land. We live in abundant, rich land. And so Israel was rich. God rained down manna. He rained down quail. He provided for them, and they ate to their full They had their desires met. Sounds a lot like us today, right? I mean, we eat to the full. As a matter of fact, we waste a lot of food. We throw a lot of food away. We we waste a lot of stuff. Believe me, we waste a lot of stuff. But we're rich in this land. So both America and Israel were rich, but they were both also rebellious. So they were rich. So another similarity between America today and Israel of the Bible is they were both rebellious. Look at verse 10 and verse 11 of Psalm 78. Verse 10 and verse 11, listen to what it says. It says, They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in His law and forgot His works and His wonders that He had shown them. So here are the children of Israel. God had rained down manna. He had rained down quail. He had provided to their full. He provided them uh, their cravings. And yet they forgot His commands. They walked away from Him. They were rebellious. The children of Israel were given by God the blueprint to be a successful people and nation. And so if I was to tell you this morning, okay, I can give you a blueprint Uh, that will help you to be successful uh, both as a person and family and even as a nation. Uh, We would would soak that up, wouldn't we? We would just like, yeah, I want to know, how can I be successful? What can I do uh, to make sure that I'm successful? Well, God had given that to the children of Israel. He's actually given it to us as well. Uh, It's called His Word, and it's called the Mosaic Law. So we look at the Old Testament, we see the Mosaic Law. That was the blueprint for the success of the children of Israel. You know the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not have no other God before me, thou shalt not have idols. You know, you know the Ten Commandments, right? That was the formula, that was the system, that was the blueprint, uh, so to speak, for a nation to be successful. And God had given that to them. If they were to follow this law, they would be blessed and their lives would be abundant. As a matter of fact, God told them, look, if you stay faithful to me, I will always give you rain and I will always give you fruit. Your land will always produce if you will do as I say. Now, the similarity with our nation is our nation was founded and established on biblical principles as well. We had a biblical blueprint that established America. Our forefathers understood the importance of the Bible and its commands. Our laws, as a matter of fact, in the beginning were biblically based. America did just like Israel did and rebelled against God. 
God is being removed from everything and anything in our nation. America is giving in to the world and its principles, which according to John in 1 John are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what we're drawn to today in our nation. America is just like it says in verse 10 and verse 11. Uh, we refuse to walk in His law, and we have forgotten His works and how He has blessed us as a nation. We're just like Israel. The more time passes, the further it seems that we move away from God as a nation. And we can read what happens to Israel in their rebellion, and God may do the same to us as a nation too if we stay in a state of rebellion. Look at verse 32 and verse 34 of um, Psalm 78. 32 through 34. Listen to what it says. It says, in spite of this, in spite of all the... All that God has done, all that He had shown them, being filled, giving them the desires, in spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in His wondrous works. Therefore, their days He consumed in futility and their years in fear. When He slew them, then they sought Him. And they returned and sought earnestly for God. And I want to stop right there. We're going to read the rest of them in just a moment. But God brought futility or emptiness to their nation. He brought fear. He slew men. He brought disaster. He did it all. He did all of that to Israel to get their attention, to get them to turn back to Him. God's trying to get our attention. God's trying to get the attention of the church. God's trying to get the attention of our nation. But the question is, are we paying attention? Are we paying attention? Both America and Israel were rich. Both America and Israel were rebellious. Thirdly, we see that both were wretched. Both were wretched. Look at verse 34 through verse 39. It says, When he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and sought earnestly for God. And then they remembered that God was their rock, and the Most High God their Redeemer. But it only ended there. Nevertheless... Verse 36, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. You see what happened here to Israel? They remembered God, came back to Him, but they only came back with lip service. So they got into a, a terrible time. They got into a difficult place. They were being overtaken by other nations. They were being um, taken captive, all this kind of stuff. And so they cry out to God. They say, oh, I remember my forefathers telling me about the times in which they left Egypt and God provided for them. And, and I remember those stories. And they cry out to God and say, God, rescue us. Come be with us. And so God would come along and He would rescue them. But it was only lip service. It was only lip service to God. Nevertheless, God poured much mercy on them. If you read through the Psalms and, and you look at the word Thanksgiving, like if you decide to do a little Bible study this week and you look at the word Thanksgiving, in many cases you'll see it, it's followed by His mercy endures forever. Study the Psalms and see how many times you see His mercy endures forever because God is full of mercy even to the wretched. God is full of mercy even to the wretched. America's had a couple of wake-up calls in the past, right? We've had a couple of wake-up calls in the past. And, and it did draw some to God. It drew many to the church, right? I remember after 9-11 how the churches were just full. And I look around today and we have many empty seats. See, there's been times that God has uh, taken events and, and people have turned to Him and said, God, we need you. But it was just lip service. Or, Where are they now? Where are they now? See, God is full of mercy even to the wretched. But God is still pouring out mercy on America. God is still pouring out mercy on America. God is still being merciful to America. 
today. So many people call themselves Christians by mouth, but lip service is not all that's required. It doesn't matter if you call yourself a Christian. It doesn't matter if you say, thank you, God. It's about your heart. Your life must back up what your lips are saying. Your life must back up what your lips are saying. I like this saying, don't let your lips write checks that your life cannot cash. Don't let your lips write checks that your life cannot cash. I know that that's probably a little twist on another uh, saying that you know of, but I like this one a little bit better, especially when it comes to Thanksgiving and being a, a, a Christian and proclaiming Christian, but not just proclaiming Christianity, but living Christianity. And so what this means is, is your life must match what your lips are saying, and I think that that's what's missing big time in the church today. We say, I'm a Christian. We say we're this, or we do that, or whatever but yet is our life showing what we say we are. So we've looked at the parallels. We've seen the similarities. We know what happened to Israel, church. We know what happened to Israel. Babylon come along. All right, The Babylonians came over, took them over. Right, Took many of them into captivity. We're not at that point yet in America. God is pouring out mercy even today on America. But what we have to do is we have to offer more than just lip service. More than just lip service. So we've seen the parallels between America and Israel. Now let's look at what God prefers. What does God want from America? What does God want from you? What does God want from me? Look at verse 8, and then let's jump down to verse 36 through 37. Verse 8. It says, It may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. So he don't want us to be like our forefathers who rebelled against God. He wants us to be faithful to God. Look at verse 36 and verse 37. It says, Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth, and they lied to him with their tongue, for their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. When looking at these verses, I think it's very clear that God desires a pure heart. God desires a pure heart. Secondly, God desires faithfulness. So He wants a, a pure heart and He wants faithfulness. God's not looking for perfection, right? God's not looking for perfection, although that's the standard. The standard's perfection. We ought to be striving for perfection, right? Because Jesus is the standard and He was perfect. What to be striving for? But that's not what God's looking for. God knows you can't be perfect. If He thought you could be perfect, He would have never have sent His Son. But because He knows you can't be perfect, He sent His Son. So He's not looking for perfection. He does not require us to clean up before we come to Him. He doesn't say, well, wait a second. Uh, you better get your life right before you come to me. You better get your life right before you come to church. You better get rid of all those things in your life that are holding you back before you come to me. But yet, that's the mentality a lot of churches have taken. This is where it gets hard. A lot of churches say, whoa, I don't know if we can have them in our church. Whoa, I don't know. They're awful sinful. I don't know if we can tolerate that in, in church. I don't know. You know where they come from. You know who they are. You know what they did. I don't know. They're not welcome here. In this church, see, that's a lot of churches say that. A lot of churches act like that. But let me tell you something. That's not the way God is. God didn't say, you better clean up where you come in. God didn't say, hey, look, get your life right. You better get perfect before you can come to me. As a matter of fact, he says, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a one of us who are worthy to come into the presence of God outside of the righteousness of Christ. So who are we to say, oh, they can't come in. They can't do this. They can't be a part of that. Right? So God's not looking for perfection. He's not asking us to clean up our act before we come. He's just simply saying, come to Him with a pure heart. In other words, come to Him saying, God, I am a mess. God, I am a wretched sinner, and I have made a lot of mistakes, and I've got all this garbage in my life. And I've got all of these scars in my life, and, and I'm, a, I'm a mess, God, but here I am. You see me for who I am, and this is all I have to offer you. It's not much. Come to God with a pure heart. That's what he wants. That's what he wants more than anything else is a pure heart. See, a pure heart is one that comes to God because of who God is, not because of what you want from God. 
I want to say that again. A pure heart is, is a heart that comes to God because of who God is, not because of what you want from God. A lot of people will come to church because they're in a desperate need. They're struggling in life. They've messed up and they need some supernatural help because they can't fix it themselves. And so they, they show up and, and, then, and then God doesn't work in their life and then they're gone. That's the lip service I was talking about. But the difference it makes when somebody comes, and yes, they're a mess, and yes, they're struggling in life, but when they come and say, God, this is all I have, but I'm giving it to you with a pure heart, and they're saying, I'm coming to you not because you can give me what I'm looking for, but I'm coming to you because you are God, and you are sovereign, and you're the only one who can fix this mess. So I come, and I just give myself to you. That's a pure heart. Coming to God because of who He is, not because of what you want from Him. See, we need, to, we need to stop giving lip service without a pure heart. How can you have a pure heart? How can you have a pure heart? A pure heart comes from being faithful. A pure heart comes from being faithful. Being faithful to God, being faithful to your family, being faithful to the church, being faithful to your neighbor, being faithful to your, your, your job and your co-workers, being faithful in everything that you do. Because the Bible says that we are to do all things as unto the Lord. And we're to do it with a, a wholeheartedly. We're to do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord. Colossians 2 and then Colossians 3. So we need to be faithful. We we come to God with a pure heart, and we're able to have a pure heart because of being faithful. And sometimes being faithful means we've got to let go of things that we know we shouldn't have in our life. Letting go of things we know we shouldn't have in our life. So what is it in your life that's holding you back from being faithful to God? What is it in your life that's holding you back from being faithful to God? Maybe it's a relationship that you know you shouldn't have. Maybe you have a relationship that you know you shouldn't have and it's holding you back from being what God would have you do. Maybe it's possessions. Maybe you have something in your life, possession, that is keeping you from being faithful to God. Maybe there's some feelings that you know you shouldn't have towards somebody else. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe it's, I don't know what it is, but there, maybe there's some feelings that you have in your heart. Maybe you have some feelings in your life and it's keeping you from being faithful to God. In order to have a pure heart, coming to God because of who He is, being faithful to God, may, you may have to let go of some things. You may have to let go of some things and let God do some work in your life. And so as we close in just a moment, I want you to search your heart. I want you to search your heart. Is there anything in your heart, is there anything in your life that you might need to get rid of? Is there any secret sin in your life that nobody knows about, but yet you have it there? Do you need to get rid of it? See, this Thanksgiving, I know many of us will offer up thanks to God, but let it be more than lip service. Let it be more than just saying, okay, it's Thanksgiving, I'm going to offer thanks to God. Let it be more than lip service. Let it come from a pure heart. Let your life, let your life offer thanks to God. We as Christians have to have pure hearts. We as Christians have to have pure hearts if our nation is to continue to be blessed by God. So it doesn't start in the world. It starts in the church. It starts in the church. If, if, if we want our nation to turn back to God, then it starts with us turning to God with a pure heart. Faithfulness. Being faithful to Him and to others. We must stand in the gap, church, for our nation and pray wholeheartedly with thanksgiving that God be with us. In America, people have become desensitized to the gospel. And we need to pray that the scales fall off their eyes and that their ears be unstopped so that they can be reached. It is unbelievable. When you go over to Thailand, you see all of these spirit houses, you see all of these temples, and they're everywhere, everywhere. And you see people bowing down, worshiping all the time, offering sacrifice, offering offerings to these idols. Is all it is. But yet they're sensitive to the gospel. We witness that. Sitting in that 10 by 10 room, the witch doctor's house of all places, and there sits a lady. Her name's Tuan. She sits there. She's there for the first time when we were there this past Monday. And she says, I want to get saved, but I can't. 
because my husband won't let me. If I get saved, then my husband will leave me. And she was able to be there with us because her husband was going to the Lantern Festival in downtown Chiang Mai. And so she was able to come. And she said, I want to be saved, but I can't. And here we are. Surround, they were surrounded by Buddhists, surrounded by this false worship, but yet sensitive to the gospel. But here in America, we are so desensitized. We put on this name badge of Christianity, but do not have pure hearts and faithfulness to God. Church, we need to be praying that scales fall off people's eyes, that ears become unstopped, so that we can reach those who are in desperate need of Christ. And so if you're here and you don't know Christ, please consider a relationship with Him today as He will change your life eternally. Just call on Him, accept His free gift by faith through Jesus Christ. Come to Him today and He'll give you abundance.